So what we're going to do today is exam one review, going over those concepts that you need to know uh, in order to be successful on this exam. Um, you know, I've sent out all of your cahoots. A lot of those ca uh, concepts are on those cahoots, weeks one, two, or three. You know, it's, it, it'll be there somewhere. Um, so go back and review them um, in uh, the PowerPoints, going and looking at them again. There are a lot of information there. All, all of you know that I do have a YouTube channel. It is Professor Bogart, Pediatric Nursing. It is public. Anybody can get on it. I have people from all over the country and I think in Europe that are looking at this YouTube station and telling me that they really, really enjoy it. So you want to look at any week, anything, everything is there for you. Okay. And it's open. Okay. One of the things that's on this exam is your theorists. One of the theorists that really is covered a lot is Erickson. So you need to know the stages of Erickson. So let me try to make it in a way that you're going to remember what stage. Because, you know, you start from an infant to get too much. Then you get up to that adolescent who can manipulate their way out of a paper bag, I call it. So trust versus mistrust. A baby cries, somebody goes, picks them up, and now they trust. Now, there are some sort of situations, could be abuse, could be um, the environment that they're living in, or it could be, oh, maybe multiple births and they can't get that child right away. Um, you don't pick up a kid within a certain amount of time. They're crying, crying, crying. Eventually, they're going to stop because now they don't trust you. They're in the stage of mistrust. A baby who has trust is happy coos and it's a you know cries less because they know when they cry somebody's coming now toddlers uh they call this 18 months to about three years old we know toddlers is one to three so it's right around there um these children are curious right they're into everything they are as um <laughs> seinfeld says a blender with the lid off they everywhere all the time. They're hard to watch and why. They're very curious and they wanna be independent and they wanna explore their environment. They are autonomous, all about me. They're egocentrical, mine, mine, auto. Automatically, I wanna do it. Well, then you have mommy, daddy, grandma, grandpa. We're saying, be careful, don't do that. You're gonna get hurt. So they're not going to be able to do some of the things that they were attempting to do. Now, if it's going to hurt them, of course, it should be stopped. But it's hard as a parent. You don't want your child to be hurt. But you got to let them explore because that's how they build on their cognitive, you know, being. That's the way they think. That's the way they learn. So that is toddlers, autonomous, and mommy and daddy and whoever are putting that shaman down in them. We get to preschooler. And it's all about they want to do things and they want to help. But they also feel guilty because they can't do everything. They don't know how to do stuff yet. Usually the tested stuff mostly is your infants and your school age and your adults. That your adolescents, those are the ones that I've seen questions on HESIs and NCLEX. They've come back and told me. Now, when it gets up to school age, this is where Erickson says, you have your industry, you have your house, your business, you're proud of it, you can do it, it works well. That means I don't do math well, I spell well, I write well, um, but I can't do everything well, so that's the inferiority. So I can't run, I can't kick a ball, I can't hit a ball, or I'm really horrible at science, whatever it is. So industry is what they do well, it's their, their house, their business. I do that really good, playing a piano, cook, whatever. I do it well. But this stuff I can't do, I feel bad about. I'm inferior, okay? And then it gets into adolescence. And remember, adolescents are all about trying to figure out who they are. 
Uh, do I like girls? Do I like boys? What do I want to be when I grow up? What group of kids do I want to hang out with? Is it the gym kids, the art kids, the band kids? And then in all of that, they still don't know what they want. And that's the confusion, trying to figure out. I mean, being an adolescent, it's really hard. Who am I and what do I want to be and being confused? So Erickson, remember those. Now, Freud is all about sexual sort of beings. So they talk about children and the infants. Remember, a pacifier self-soothes an infant all the time, or a finger, or a thumb, or a toy, a rattle, right? So we know that they get pleasure and calming, and they explore the world in their mouth. That's oral. Anal is just potty training. And what comes first in potty training is bowel. Bowels are always trained first. They can feel it there. So they know how to run to the bathroom to get rid of it quicker than their urine. Phallic stages is uh, that exploration as young children, but it also is boys like their moms and girls like their dads. It's just part of, you know, understanding the differences. Latency, it's all about same-sex peers. Usually you will not have a boy and a girl that are their best friends in school age. Um, and that's exploring and now it's understanding other people's opinions too. And then of course, adolescents, they always think with their genitals, right? They're always, you know, trying to explore those things and wherever they want to with another girl, another boy or, or both or whatever. Now, Kohlberg is all about right and wrong, and there's a consequence for each. We know that initially they know right, wrong, and they're going to get time out or whatnot. And then it gets up to the point where they want to do right. They want to please, okay? And then as that's like your school age, your conventional. And the post-conventional is, you know, society has rules that you need to follow, uh, one of the rules that came out, you know, many years ago, but no smoking in restaurants, right? So now, you know, you can't walk into a, you know, not saying adolescents do, but just one of those rules, you know, they get driving at the stop of the stop sign, you know, that there's manners that have to be followed. They understand what's accepted by society and they try to do that. So Kohlberg, whenever you see morality, right, wrong, this is who it is. And it's all about right, wrong, consequence for eat. And it could be reward, punishment and reward going on with your younger kids. Now, PHA is all about how to think. So initially, we have a reflex grasp, right? We grab a rattle. All of a sudden, it moves. And you're like, hmm, I like that. So they do it again. So that's building on understanding. Oh, that happened by happenstance. But, oh, I like that. And now you have like... You just go ahead and they just do their Palmer grasp and they grab it by themselves voluntarily, right? Then they put it in their mouth. Oh, they like that too. So they start to learn this. Well, then they start getting older and they start saying, okay, mom went to the kitchen, but I want her here watching me and helping me, whatever, eating in the high chair. And I take my sippy cup and I throw it on the floor because I know what mom's going to come. It's also getting, um, making things like a, a broom into a horsey and riding around. It's like they're thinking, magical sort of type of thinking going on. Now, as we get into concrete, we're talking school age again, right? Concrete means they've seen it, smelt it, done it, touched it, okay? They know what they've seen, so they know what to do. Now, adolescents can fight their way through a paper bag and figure out 10 different ways to get there. I tell my class it's that adolescent who did something wrong and now can't go out Friday night with his buddies and them. And he's like, oh, I got to go out. So what can I do to make mommy change her mind? Take the garbage out, you know, do the dishes, give her hugs and kisses, clean the room. Or whatever mom is into, they're going to figure it out. Formal operations. They can figure them completely, right? Concrete, they need to see it, know it. Formal, they can figure it out. These are all some pictures which are showing you those sort of things, you know, and some more um, talking about 
all of the things I just said. They're there for you to look, go back, try to figure out, okay? But what, the way I explain it, I think you'll understand it more. Now, play. <clears throat> play is so important. Not only what they do, but as nurses, what sort of play do the age groups play in? So if we have a child in the hospital with us, and mom's not there, what type of play are they going to play? And how do you challenge them or not? Okay. So onlooker, you just look. Somebody's doing something. They're watching. They stare at it. Solitary, the kids are playing alone. Nobody else, just them alone. Now, parallel play, they're both playing with whatever toys. They're not sharing, but they're next to each other. Okay. Then it comes up to associative. Two or more children playing with all the same things. Now, they might be doing things together or maybe not, but there's no goal. These are your preschoolers. Preschoolers play together. Now, as we get into cooperative play, it's still two or more children playing with blocks, but somebody wins. They make something. They take the blocks. They make a house. They make a castle. They do whatever they're going to do, there is a goal. That's your school age. That could be checkers, right? Any board game absolutely is a cooperative play. Now, as we get into nursing, and I think this is one thing that hit me really hard when I moved from a very small town in New York where there was no culture, none. And I moved to Miami when I was 21 years old, very naive, a very protected child, and I ran into culture. And as a nurse, I love to talk, I love to teach, and I had to learn how do you address your clients, your family, your children. Now, one of the things about culture is if you don't know, you know, some of the children can tell you what they need, or you can ask the uh, parent themselves. Um, for instance, it could be food. Some don't eat meat. Some don't eat cow. Some don't eat pork. Some ones might want something else. Maybe there's some sort of religious thing they have to do. You know, and they're allowed to do all that. It's not going to interfere with their medical care. It could be there's some that they don't want a female with a male nurse, only females. And they don't want to undress very slowly, on, you know, open up little pieces of the robe, never have them completely naked sitting there. So again, when you don't know, ask them and always know that you don't have to believe in their spirituality, but you need to know who you believe in. Where's your spiritual perspective? But you don't force that on them and they don't force theirs on you, but it's, a, a, you know, um, this type of relationship you're both can understand what you want to do and you give them that opportunity um, to um, do their spirituality the way they want to. Now, assessing a child is completely different usually than an adult because kids ain't going to let you do what you want to do when you want to do it, period. That's just what they are. So number one, when you go up to a child, you always get below them. You never stand above them because they feel like you're looking down and now you're threatening. So I would, if they're sitting on a stretcher or a bed, pull a chair up and I'd actually sit lower. That's the first thing. Then on their developmental level, you start explaining things and then maybe have an animal or a stuffed, maybe they have a stuffed, you know, teddy bear and having, you know, look at listening to breast sounds on that teddy bear. And then, of course, letting the older children touch the stethoscope, maybe listening to themselves. And that's great. Now, infants, I think, are hard. And remember, head to toe is not happening with children. You can get what you can get when they give it to you. If an infant's asleep in mom's arms, perfect time for breast sounds and heart sounds because they're not cooing and moving and crying and you can really hear, right? One of the things that we need to always be careful for in pediatrics is knowing that we're there to protect our children. And child abuse does happen. I've seen some horrific things in my career. So if you have an injury 
that does not match what mom's saying is something that you need to um, find out, to investigate. Um, I had one baby come in with a, you know, a purple mark on the head. And when I just picked up the, the baby very gently to put on the scale, I could feel that head smush. And I had a suspicion right away. And yes, that child was abused, had multiple fractures all over the place. So, you know, it is the nurse that actually catches these things first. You know, another thing is if you have an assessment and you have a, a child that's been abused, remember moms and dads and nanas, pop pops, whoever, are they're feeling bad too. So remember, they brought this child to you because they're concerned of maybe a sexual assault, right? Um, so remember them because they uh, are suffering also. Mush housing syndrome is when mom likes to make babies sick through whatever. They like that attention. I'm not sure all why. Um, but remember, if you have suspicion, this is a child who's constantly in the hospital, constantly going to the ER, constantly to the doctor, something may be wrong. So if the child is uh, there with the mother, make sure that somebody's there monitoring their space with that child so they can't harm the child. Again, taking care of the kid. Now, physical findings are different than you know, your assessments that we do, the history. So remember, physical is what you can see and hear and touch. So vital signs, growth, and then listening to the lungs, the bowels and pulses and all of that sort of stuff. So remember, there are differences. Now, growth at any age is dependent upon what? Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. You know, if you don't put gas in the car, it's not running. And if we look at an infant born at seven pounds, they should by six months double it, be 14 pounds. And by one year, they should triple their weight and be uh, 21 pounds. The first six months, they gain an inch every month. This is incredible growth that's going on, right? So knowing that we need to feed them what they need for six months, sometimes they say four to six, we introduce food, but let's say the first six months, you know, it is breast milk or iron fortified formula. Okay. Now, if we're taking a child six months old, born at seven pounds, comes in and they're only 10 pounds, we need to evaluate that as in, let them do a 24 hour diary. What did that kid eat? How much did they eat, right? And if it's breastfeeding, you wanna know how much longer on each breath, breast and how many diapers need to be changed. Is that showing you if it's wet, we know that they're getting enough, right? And maybe they need fortifier or something extra for calories if they're too low. Conversely, if they're too much, they're not going to be able to do all those physical growth and development things like sitting up and pulling up and creeping and crawling and walking. So we need to look at exactly what they eating. So 24 hour diaries. I mean, always with nutrition, any age group, those 24 hour or food diaries are invaluable. Here we go. Adolescence and body weight. We know the BMIs is something to look at. And they're saying that a child in the 85 percentile is a risk for overweight. They're, they're heavier. But when they get to 95 percentile, these children are obese. They are overweight, okay? And again, how do we look at too much, too little? Do a food diary. What are they eating? And making suggestions. Remember, adolescents, you still got to put some of that good food in there. You know, that reward, um, because it is hard for an adolescent to um, maintain diets, especially with their environments and, and their all their friends, etc. Now, developmental assessments are really, really important. Just like the weights that we're looking at, are they too much? Are they too little? Well, those developmental assessments can tell you, is there a neurological problem? What's happening? Or do they just need therapy? Um, when you have a child who's not turning completely over by eight months, front to back, back to front, it's a problem. 
They're not sitting up unsupported by 10, 11 months. Something's going on. So what can we do? Well, we do what we call early intervention. And there's three things that that usually involves. Speech, physical, and occupational therapies. Now, if they're not turning, moving, et cetera, that's OT, PT, absolutely. And these kids, what's so great, they catch up pretty quickly and they get back into the mainstream where they should be. I mean, ever have a kid at one and a half or 18 months that really is not speaking more than a couple words, speech therapy catches them up, then you can't shut them up. I mean, my first two grandsons, they didn't talk and all of a sudden it's like, Wow, they're really yapping up a storm now. And, and that's what this does. Early in, it's early steps is one of the types of programs that we do use, and that's the one that's in Florida. Assessing a child. Well, first we're gonna look. I can see a sick kid from across the room just by the way that they're holding themselves, the color of them, the way they're breathing, moaning, limping, all of these things. Looking at their bellies, now small infants can have a lot of digestive disorders for many different reasons. So first you look at their abdomen. Is it round, is it soft, or is it loopy? Loopy's a problem. Then you're gonna listen and you go upper to lower, left to right. Percussion, looking for organs. Is the liver there? you know, feeling what's going on and feel gas, stool, anything hard in there, that palpation going on there. So that's how we look at that. Now, when you get to next quarter, and this is a really good thing to look at, is knowing where heart sounds are. You know, um, the aortic valve, pulmonic valve, tricuspid valve, and mitral valve. Now, week five is all about cardiac and where those valves are, but it's a great refresher because you need to know anatomy before you come to week five and learn about cardiac and pulmonary. So these are the things, and you've just got to look at them and know where they are. I mean, I can read them off, but you understand that. Now, one of the things that I put here is that How do you assess an infant's heart rate and where do you place your stethoscope? Well, that is the fourth intercostal space on the left side and it's one full minute. And we know, like I've already said, a sleeping baby is the best one to listen to. Breath sounds. Now, children tend to have a lot of upper airway, a lot of mucus, and sometimes you hear referred sounds in the lungs, but it's not in the lungs, it's all of this. So knowing where bronchial, bronchiovascular and and vascular um, sounds are, will teach you, is it upper or is it lower? Those bronchial, bronchial vessel, these areas here really talk about what's in the nose and whatnot. Kids don't blow their nose, right? They keep it in there and they just wipe it and wipe it. Um, It's just part of who children are. Um, We know that vascular, that vesicular, is those lower sounds. And usually that's what we really wanna hear. Can we hear sounds out of those lungs? Now, car seats. Now we have seat belts, the adults, but children need to be safe. You know, the funny part is looking at that upper picture in the left. I remember my brother sitting in one of those seats. You know, um, that's a long, long time ago, but I still remember that. And um, it was, in the front seat, because then I sat next to him, and then my mom sat next to me, and my daddy drove. So they've been around for a while, but today, we don't believe the front seat no more, because that's where all of the injuries occur. So (laughs) rear facing in the middle of the back seat is what they recommend. I know we, and I, have always put it in the back behind the passenger seat, so that I could turn around and look easier, right? But they're saying in the middle is the best place to do. Rear facing should be until they're two years old. Now, Christian was a peanut, he wasn't 30 pounds yet, but because he was of age and developmentally where he needed to be, it was two that was the the deciding factor, not the weight, okay? Harness straps they put on, make sure that they're snug, you know, and remember, again, they're rear-facing until they're two years old. 
this is a little bit more about it. Always remember too, um, I, you know, it's hard to be a parent today and getting all the equipment they need and going to a, you know, a garage sale and getting an old car seat doesn't behoove the child because they do expire. So making sure that we know that they're in an appropriate car seat, a new one or one that you got from a hospital because they have all those programs. I know the pediatric hospital I worked at, they had what we call car seat month, monthly where they'd come in and they'd even give car seats away. Um, a lot of the uh, companies donated them. Now infants, this is probably the most growth and development you're going to see on most of the exams. Because why? They go from not being able to hold their head up all the way to one year old where now they're attempting to walk if they're not walking, right? So what are some of those growth and development milestones? Well, initially an infant by three months old should be able to, when you pull them up by the arms, their head comes with it. It doesn't lag back. And that's what head lag means. That means they have no neck control, that something's wrong. So if we're at five, six months and they have head lag, something's wrong, it needs to be investigated. They might just need therapy, that early intervention, but it needs to be looked at. Remember, all babies should be put on their back or supine to go to sleep. They have found a lower incidence of SIDS death with putting them on their back. And remember, there's all sorts of risk factors for SIDS. They should be able to roll from their, their bellies over to their back by about five months. And then it's their back to their belly by six months. So a kid at six months old, you wouldn't let them lay in anywhere where they can roll off onto the floor, either from the table, the changing table, the couch, anywhere. You want to make sure that they are buckled in wherever they are. They do put their feet in their mouth. They're grasping objects voluntarily about three months. And remember, explore the world through their mouths. That's they're all about their oral. The first, usually, beginning of teeth is about six months. And they usually get one per month. It doesn't mean if you don't get a tooth at six months, don't have six by year old that they're behind. I've always said, my kids, even grandchildren, they never got teeth till 15 months and then they had like six or eight pop up. So uh, you could feel them under their gums. They knew that they were coming. They should be able to pull themselves up like to the side of the couch and they start walking around or the coffee table is a good one that they do on. And again, sitting unsupported by eight months. Now, colic is, oh, one of the hardest things I think for parents, children, uh, infants who cry, it is hard because parents need to work. They have other kids, other responsibilities. They're crying all night. They don't sleep. And it usually goes away by three or four months of age, but it is a long time for them. Okay. It's hard. It's hard. Now, one of the things though with colic, if you have, let's say you're in um, a hotline, you're in the ER, you get a phone call or a doctor's office, a phone call from a mother that uh, their baby, a young baby especially, is crying, crying, crying. Don't ever assume it's colic and tell them to get gas drops. Don't do that. Have them come in. It could be something more serious, okay? So remember, colic. It doesn't matter breastfed, doesn't matter formula, it can happen. You know, there's all different things we can teach about burping and sitting up and medications. Um, but sometimes these kids will still have it. There's a colic hold, the bouncing, all of these things. But again, never think it's colic if you get a phone call. You got to see that baby to be sure. Now, developmental periods, and you know, this is part of definitions, all right? Sequential stage is that everything happens in a predictable motion. They lift their head, they are going to go from their belly to back, back before the belly, they get up and they start crawling, they creeping, they stand, they walk. This is all part of it, okay? Developmental stages, you know, these are children that sometimes will 
skip things as in they might go from rolling around to standing up and they never sit you know if they can roll around and then stand up you know they can sit if they wanted to but this is their pace what they do and some of them are quicker and sensitive period are those areas where um the children does uh, it, they're not making big developmental but psychologically is where they get more. It could be, you know, learning how to figure out the rattle and doing things. It could be sitting there and sitting in, in the high chair and go, oh, if I throw this cup, it's they start to learn. It's not more of development. It's more of psychosocial. Now, all babies are born with soft spots. You know, things that, oh, don't touch that. It's going to hurt them. Well, I think they're some of the best things that we have. Um, I think we assess infants so well by looking at these uh, fontanelles. Now, anterior is the one right there. And that should close about one year to 18 months. And the one in the back, it should close about six, eight weeks. And those things are normal. Now, what if they close too early? Well, can the brain expand, right? They close too late. Well, the brain is exposed. Why? Is it hydrocephalus, a brain tumor, whatever? So this is something we look at. Also, as we go on to some of the diagnoses, feeling that soft spot, we can see if it's bulging or if it's sunken. And a sunken would be a dehydrated baby. And that one that's going up and bulging could be a meningitis. So really, really great place to assess infants. Now, babies are born and the eyes don't work together. This eye works and this eye works but they're independent of each other, okay? And by about 12 months, they start working together. And what that means now is, now they have better depth perception. Because if you take your finger and put it up and you point to something, both of your eyes will go there. If then you grab it and you get it easy. What if one eye works and the other works somewhere else? You are all over trying to find it. And that's infants and absolutely normal. Now, remember your pain scales, really important, okay? So how would you know a kid was in pain? Now, infants, I think, and nonverbal, you really have to look. And nonverbal children could be 18-year-old children with cerebral palsy who don't speak. So remember, this scale um, is flack for these children. But what are some things that you would see? That you would say, oh, this kid must hurt. Well, if they're crying, grimacing, that little chin goes, and that hurts me. They will cry tears unless they're dehydrated, okay? Their eyes are tightly closed. They're pulling their arms, their legs up and down. You might see whimpering. So make sure you evaluate it with the proper pain scale. Infants up to age three and nonverbal are the flex scale, right? And then after that is the faces which we look at, you know, you know, just like the numeric scale, but their faces now, um, you have two to 10 um, type of thing. And you could figure out which one. And children three, four years old will point to a face really easy. So you evaluate, give them something, give them some uh, something for pain, whether it's Tylenol, whether it's ibuprofen or morphine um, and improper doses, okay? And remember, there's also uh, distraction works well, keeps their mind off of it. Um, and infants just sitting there and cooing with them and talking with them, right? And so maybe it's, you know, um, repositioning, um, sitting them up, they're laying down, sitting them up. And remember, taking a pacifier with a little bit of sugar water, putting it in their mouth is like giving them morphine. And that's been proven by your Harvard neuropsychologist, believe it or not, as part of my dissertation. And it works well. Now, I said, SIDS death, there's things you've got to worry about. And what are these uh, things that can happen? And why does it happen? Well, again, we want these children all to be on their backs, okay? You know, they say um, sides, but, you know, they're actually going against that. They want all of them on their back. There sh should be in a nice, solid type of um, mattress 
um, shouldn't be loose bedding in there because it can swish up in their face. Um, those cute little bumper pads of yesteryear that I had on all my kids, they can hang themselves on it, okay? So no, you shouldn't have them in bed with you sleeping. And one of the things we tend to do is overdress our infants. We think that they can't hold their own heat. Now, initially at birth, that's correct. They, they need that wipe off that body, you know, initially after birth with a warm blanket, put them underneath that radiant warmer and warm them up. Yes. And bundle them after, you know, uh, a month or two, they're already lost all of that fluid, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe one extra shirt. Um, and if you're keep you comfortable and the baby's comfortable too, you don't want it heated. No smoking and no secondhand smoke that really um, hurts that the infant. Uh, prenatal care is so important. And if a child's just had a cold with, you know, the mucus in the nose, you're going to see that can cause blockage of the airway. Young mothers, premature, low birth weight, and believe it or not, males are more than your girls in um, infants for SIDS death. And we know that breastfeeding decreases the chances of SIDS death. Formula fed babies have more. So reflexes, really important. You know, Babinski, all of us have it. You know, from babies to adults, they always have it. You know, and then we're talking some of the ones that we need to know is the grasp. We know it starts out with reflex the voluntary. We know they're going to crawl. You know, you put them up, they're, they're going to sit there and, you know, try to move their feet up, you know, when they're standing up. And then the startle reflex or moral reflex, they just move with a sound or a sudden touch. A parachute reflex is when you turn a child over, down, facing down, to put them down, their arms and legs will come up. It sort of protects them. Um, you know, what do you do when you fall? forward your arms come up right that's why kids get a lot of fractured wrists um whether one bone two bones both wrists or one wrist um it's all part of it it protects them very very normal and this starts to appear in about six to nine months and you you keep that forever actually nutrition nutrition again like i said that we do recommend breastfeeding for the first six months not, they can, um, of course, do the iron fortified formula. Um, they say eight to 10 minutes on each breast or until it's empty. And at birth, children always lose about 10% of their body weight. And they usually, believe it or not, in two weeks already gained all of it. And, you know, they're gaining half an ounce per day for the first four months of life. It's quite two months of life. It's pretty amazing. They, they skinny and they just puff up and get pudgy again. We know mothers with breastfed babies, uh, especially if they had to be in the newborn ICU where we weigh everything and measure everything, um, they're going to be concerned, are they getting enough milk from their breast? As long as they're having six to eight wet diapers per day, we know we're doing good. And breastfed babies should get some vitamin D, good with their muscle development, et cetera. At that four to six months, you know, the six months is what I like to say. I don't like it any earlier than that. Their digestive systems are very, very immature. And we know that being immature means if you want to give them fruits or vegetables earlier, it's just going to come out in the stool. And they're wasting all of that energy and calories eating it, and it's doing them no good. So breastfed, formula fed, up to six months old. At six months introduce one food at a time and wait four to seven days in between before adding another food. They say rice cereal is the least allergenic. Start with that. And most um, pediatricians will recommend it. Now, check for allergies. Now, what would allergies be? Well, it could be anywhere from a rash to uh, diarrhea, constipation, vomiting to anaphylaxis, right? So um, need to look at it. It could be a diaper rash that they never had before. It could be that. Remember, 
when we start to feed these foods, it doesn't mean all of a sudden magically at six months, their GI tract uh, does take and digest everything. You're still going to see food up the first year. Absolutely. Little pieces of it. And But you'll see as they get older, less and less is going to come out. I mean, adults have corn, right? Corn's always there. So just think about that, about it's something that the GI tract doesn't always um, get rid of everything. Whole milk should be started at 12 months. And remember, when you feed them food first, and then you're going to be giving them milk, okay? Either breast or, or the formula. And then we could switch all of that to whole milk at 12 months. And we know some parents continue breastfeeding. That's fine, but it is recommended. And they need the fat in the whole milk. Now, immunizations. Immunizations are key. There's many that needs to be given. We know that uh, hepatitis B is the first one. It's given at the hospital. And um, it's given other doses too as we go along. So we give them at two months. We give them at one month, two months, six months, 18 months. It's just to prevent that from going on. The influenza vaccine, um, and there's so many we give, but we don't give that till six months of age. So just remember that as, as one of the things we're given rotavirus, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, haemophilus, pneumococcal, polio. These are all in the infants, right? And the one thing that parents are concerned about giving, what, three, four injections sometimes, you know, in each thigh, um, we can give them a local topical anesthetic, rub it on and numb it before. And remember afterwards, we can put some, if it's getting warm, tell the parents to a nice cool rag or a warm rag and then bicycle their legs. And that can help them uh, with the pain of it. And of course, Tylenol for those little fevers. That's the schedule, it's all there. I'm not telling you to remember all of it. You don't need to know um, when, just to know that they are given, that hepatitis is first. We give a lot at two, four, six months. Influenza is not until six months for your um, infant. Now, babies are born, they have big heads. And then all of a sudden, around 12, 50 months, the head and the chest are equal. And then the chest should be bigger than the head. It's just part of children's growing. Now, I've sort of talked about how do you approach a child? We know we get down lower. We know that um, we start um, doing things non-invasive first um, and less threatening. Uh, we know using play, especially on toddlers, works really, really well. And again, in the parent's arms is absolutely the perfect place. Actually, that's the program I developed called Huggies. Help us give great injections efficiently and safely, H period, U period. And I promoted and researched that children did so much before, during, after. They did so much better uh, as evidenced by less crying. So um, I always say, hold your child. Child feels better. Have another nurse help, of course. Um, and then you can give your injection a lot easier if you need to or start an IV or whatever you need to do. Pain in toddlers, we know what happens. Kids in pain, toddlers usually just go in the corner. They don't eat and they might be crying, okay? Toddlers, you'll see a little more. We know that flack is before. I've already talked all about that. And again, um, know that with any, with the toddlers, it is flack. Remember, with these children, non-pharmacological pharmacological strategies are important. That distracting, repositioning, music works amazing. I worked night shifts, so I used to have that unit blasting with some old golden oldies, and the kids would sleep so well. And massage, you know, they're even doing massage class for kids for little babies now. Older kids, hot packs, cold packs, distraction, give them an iPad and let them play a game, right? <laughs> and of course, putting the head up, down, etc. And again, even with kids, make sure that if these kids are afraid of the pain, we can always numb it and we can decrease their fear. Toddlers grow slower. We know that. They don't gain triple their birth weights at all. 
it's only four to six pounds, and they only quadruple their birth weight by two and a half years. Okay, know that they don't eat a lot. They actually go into what we call a physiologic anorexia. One tablespoon of food per meal, per age, is really all they need. So they eat like crazy as infants and they stop eating. And you're like, oh my God, he's not eating a thing. Well, that's normal. Their growth and their fine motor development is uh, getting more. They're, they're very clumsy at age one. By age three, they're more refined. They're using both hands. They're throwing, they're, um, throwing a ball by about a year and a half. Toddlers are all parallel play because they don't share. Mine, mine, I'm going to be there next to you, but you're not touching my stuff. They are uh, one word sentences when they become one, usually mommy, daddy, right? And then by two multi word sentences, you know, a little three, four uh, word sentences, and they're trying to talk to you now. They want to feed themselves, even if the spoon's upside down and backwards, let them go. Um, they're trying, they're playing, they're dressing, they're taking clothes on and off. Now, you know, they might dress with it stuff inside out backwards, but you know something, it's the attempt that's the important thing. Toilet training, you know, the signs of readiness, they can have dry diapers for two hours. They're aware of their bodily functions and they want to please mom or dad, right? And then we know bowels come before bladder. You can feel the stool there easier than urine. So bowels should be started before you're um, training your bladder, okay? One of the things that um, is concerning with your toddlers is that they're so into everything. Like I said, two-year-olds like having a blender without a lid on. I'm everywhere. It's called the terrible twos. They are intensely exploring their world. And they will just throw themselves on the floor and have temper tantrums and, you know, no, 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 mine, 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 negativism, right? Egocentrical, all about me. The best way to discipline a toddler is a timeout. One minute per year of age, you need to explain to them what they did and tell them when they're quiet their time will start. And that usually works. And temper tantrums, let them go. Let them have it. As long as they're not hurting themselves or others. Preschoolers, they're still slow, slow growth. Very similar to your toddler. Their nutrition, again, they're pickier. They're not going to eat foods they don't want to eat. They, it's just the way that they are. With Kohlberg, again, this is punishment and reward, right? Kohlberg, good and bad consequence for each, all right? So if you know um, somebody is trying to do something, um, being good, they're looking for that reward. And if they're bad, they know they're being punished. Toddlers um, do, and preschoolers, also know when other people aren't feeling good. Um, I know that little Christian at age two, um, I was having a big uh, rheumatoid arthritis flare in my knee and I had ice on it. And he came over to me and he gave my knee a hug and kissed it. And of course it's all better. Um, that was something at a very young age that they do, but it's just part of Kohlberg and what he believes. Preschoolers, the age of Band-Aids, you cut, blood comes out, they're gonna bleed to death or insides are coming out and they're gonna die. And that's preschoolers, okay? Um, they think if they get hurt, they've done something bad. They hit the sister, their sister, they didn't eat their dinner, whatever they believe is a bad thing. They didn't put their toys away, whatever it is. Um, this is what they believe in. We talked about faces scale. It's very similar to an numeric scale, but there's faces instead. Sometimes you see scales from zero to five or zero to 10, um, and, but they're the same. And they do really well picking out that picture. Gross motor skills on your preschooler, ages three to six. At three, they can walk a line. They can walk a balance beam. They can skip, gallop, walk backwards. They can ride a bicycle. 
Some ride bicycles, mostly are tricycles or with training wheels. They can catch a ball. Now they're jumping with two feet. Now, as they get older, of course, it's going to be more coordinated. They can stand on one foot, get on their tippy toes and hop. They can jump and um, they can run and they can jump over things and they can go from side to side, back and forth. And they're just more skilled with it. Now, by age six, children, remember, we're getting to school age now, right? That's that, that break off point. Remember, everything we give a kid to do um, in school age is something that is challenging, but they can accomplish the task when they get there, okay? So they can ride a bike. They have to learn, right? Jumping rope. Now it's going to take time to learn it, but they'll do it. And also, how do you play hopscotch? It's going to take some work at first, but they're going to be able to do it. It's, it's something that they can accomplish. Now, preschool and fine motor skills. Um, if we look button to button, coloring inside the lines, making things, putting things on, they're getting more uh, with their uh, fingers, can do a lot better things. Now, getting ready for kindergarten. Um, preschoolers, is, is, this is the age where um, getting them ready and making them feel like they want to go there and they want to do it, right? So parents, positive attitudes. Reading to children, I can't express how important that is. It makes them want to learn a story and figure it out, right? Um, and then getting them in programs where they're with other children to start getting along, right? And then just encouraging them to run and jump and play and color and do what they need. Um, it's a part of learning and getting them ready for it. And of course, promoting them talking about, you know, don't let the other kids in the family or yourself tell the child what he's trying to say. Let the kid try to express it. Communicable diseases, there's lots of them, mostly viruses. We know that children, as they get diseases, they build up their immune systems, as they get immunization, you know, they build up resistance. One of the ones that, um, that I don't know if you're aware of, if you get chicken pox, varicella, you get the vaccine, it doesn't mean you're not going to get the disease, you still can. Now, as a nurse, and I worked in the emergency room, and we would get children in with low-grade fever and would have a rash with juicy sort of looking things, lesions. And I would immediately take those children and put a mask on me, a very protective N95. And then these children can get other kids sick. And in the ER or in a hospital, you've got immunosuppressed children all over the place. They don't need to get um, your chicken pox. Get them into one of those negative pressure rooms. That means the air from the room goes out. It's not recirculated in the hospital, okay? When can they go back to school is when all the lesions are crusted and they're dry. No more juicy lesions. You might have some pox and looking things, but as long as they're dry, they are no longer contagious. Physical abuse, I've already talked about it. You know, remember, it's your responsibility to um, report it. Um, physical re uh, abuse is uh, no food, shelter, or supervision. You know, um, not getting the medical care that they need. You know, um, even mental health is considered this. And, and that is abuse. Not getting those kids the education that they need. And then of course, those emotional parents are just not there for that child. And most of all, we'll see with those emotional is some of those children, um, you, you don't have time to spend with them. And this is part emotional, permitting a child to use drugs or other alcohols. And that probably would be like your older kids. Sexual abuse, we know it happens. And emotional abuse. So um, remember, if you suspect anything, Make sure that it's reported and we could get the proper people in. Um, I've seen three cases and I know that three of them came through me and those children did get what they needed in the end and they were safe. OK, so remember, some of it is what the history of what happened and the injuries don't match 
or the parent and the kids stories are different. And I try to ask the kids, so what did you do to hurt yourself? And let's see if it's the same as what mom said, um, especially when you get them alone. And then remember, if you have a child that somebody else is doing the abusing and they're bringing them in to you to check, remember, just like sexual abuse, any abuse, parents are also suffering. Remember, they need a hug too, right? Nutrition, when we talk preschoolers, they're going to need 1,200 to 1,400 calories a day. They need their protein and their calcium for strong bones. And remember that there are different diets, like the vegetarian diet, or you have children with iron deficient anemia. Making sure parents know that we can give them foods to help them with their underlying conditions, right? If they're all vegetarian, making sure they get enough of the protein through other ways. You know, iron deficient anemia, iron, green leafy vegetables, eggs, and meat can also provide that. So nutrition is not just like one thing. It's different for the child. School ages 6 to 12 starts with your baby teeth coming out, some permanent teeth coming in. Growth is gradual again. But for six years, your height's going to be one to two feet. They're getting higher and they're going to be weight almost doubles. Boys and girls are all about the same going through it. Big thing is injury prevention. Know that motor vehicle is always the highest level of injuries in all age children. Whether they're sitting in the car, they are outside the car, ran over by cars, okay? Also know that um, factors for injuries in children, children who all of a sudden start to get a bunch of injuries, something's going on at home. It could be a divorce, could be, you know, um, somebody moved out, could be they moved, could be a friend moved. I mean, stress could be stress. Kids have their own decisions on what their stress is. Remember, water safety, very important, um, needs to be done for those around water, pools, etc. They're saying rear vehicle seat until 13 years old. You know, my kids were sitting in the front seat shotgun at nine years old. Well, we didn't know back then. Booster seats till eight, eight years old, using bicycle helmets, all sorts of um, equipment. You know, I live in an area where ATVs are all over the place, out in, you know, the Everglades. They should not be used by children younger than 16. They don't know how to handle themselves. And um, your supervision, what happens when they're a mile away from you, right? You don't know where they are. They get on with somebody else, but they can't go alone. And obesity. You know, children today do a lot of electronic devices, right? TV and their switch and their iPads and phones and whatever, um, and they're sitting and they're eating snacks. And it's a really time where we can teach children. School age are thirsty to learn, right? We know that children who are overweight, that there is an increased risk of what we call cardiometabolic changes. That means a risk for diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, in, you know, um, adolescents and adults, okay? There is no race culture. It's across all barriers, okay? And we know that prevention and education in school age works well. Again, school age, same sex, right? Same peer. Preparing for procedures. Are you six or are you 12? If you're six, you're going to get an x-ray, you know, a little boy's going to think these radiation beams coming out and zapping through me, right? Because that's where their minds are. So no, it's a big camera, but we can see your insides and I'll show you when you come back, right? That's non-threatening. An older kid might know. ADHD, attention deficit. There are kids who can't sit and focus. The big thing is inattentive, hyperactivity, impulsivity going from one task to another to another, finishing nothing. Remember, if we get to the point where they're disruptive in school as a school nurse, remember that we are 
um, going to listen to the parent first. They probably have tried some stuff and it's not working. So together, you know, make a plan of care. Don't assume a parent's doing nothing. Depression. Kids, you know, when you get to depression in older school age and then becoming adolescents, it's a big thing. And it can happen. Um, it could be due to their home environments. It could be due to their what they look like, et cetera, et cetera. So knowing signs of depression, you know, not wanting to do anything, not wanting to go out, not eating right or eating too much, not sleeping enough, sleeping too much, um, or even talking about expressing suicide is something to take seriously. Dental health, we need to recommend these kids, school age, you're getting their permanent teeth. They need to stay there for a long time. So brushing their teeth at least before bedtime. Flossing is very important. But remember, most first graders, which is about your six, seven-year-olds, they don't know how to floss properly. I mean, they've got those sticks, but even then, they're not doing it well. They're going to need help. Soft bristles, fluorinated toothpastes, absolutely. And know that if they're losing permanent teeth, they're not doing good dental health. And if their teeth are hurting, we know there's a cavity somewhere. An adolescent, how are you gonna talk with an adolescent? Hardest group to talk to. Because remember, you're a nurse, you're threatening. So again, open a conversation. Whether they're listening to music, what do you listen to? Or you see a sports jersey on. Oh, so you like the New York um, Yankees or whatever. Or talk about, oh, your sneakers. Those are really good. I said, what are they called? You know, these are things that are important to adolescents. That breaks it open. We know adolescents are looking for who they are sexually, and who are they going to be when they grow up? And they're going to be experimenting. They are going to be out there trying to be adults, right? They're fighting for independence without any responsibilities. That's what they do. And it's uh, parents need uh, to help set boundaries with them and working for compromises. Again, body image in this does cause depression and it can get to the point they will commit suicide. Just be careful. Cause of death? Well, they're exploring. They're big boys now. They can play with daddy's guns. So you're going to see that homicide and it's just usually happenstance or maybe it's in a gang, but usually it's not really um, what they wanted to do. And remember, um, suicide, body image. Nutrition, they should be eating good um, because they have that big um, adolescent growth spurt, you know, but they tend to grab a water bottle and a snack bar and they tend to go and go, 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 go. Any problems with nutrition, again, what do we do? A diary, diary. Remember, there are all sorts of feeding disorders. It needs to be looked at and that diary might help figuring out what's going on. Remember, as adolescents, they need to be getting the HPV, um, the three dose series um, to make sure of cervical cancer. It's girls and boys, okay? Talking to an adolescent about sex, well, most of them won't speak in front of their parents. I wouldn't talk in front of my mother, are you kidding me? I mean, I would be afraid. So again, going in there, doing a broad open-ended question and then listen and be prepared for what they're gonna say because they will tell you things that you're gonna be shocked, but you'd rather them talk to you and then give them, you know, talk to them about information they need and maybe give them some written information for them to look at. Gaining their trust is hard, as I said, picking up that, um, their trust. Again, it's just sitting there and listening and, you know, uh, opening the conversation with, so what do you want to be? Are you going to go to college? Have you decided yet? Or, oh, you play sports, whatever the conversation. Adolescents should be sleeping because of all this growth that they're going on, but they don't. They're on their phones, texting to their new boyfriend, girlfriend, late at night, you know, they are 
in all the activities after school. And then you've got the children who are trying to get the A's to get into college. So they're not sleeping as much as they should. So it's all about what's going on. It's normal for them. It's not what they should. But the reason is so much is happening that they don't have time to sleep. Depression of suicide, I've already said it. What goes on? Why does it happen again? And then Tanner stages of development. This was a question that was off the HESI, where they're saying, which stage is it? So how do you remember? One is where it's just normal. And then it gets into first stage in a female, it's breast bud start. And then in males, enlargement of their scrotum, their, their testicles. And then it goes into what your normal shape is. Remember, these girls um, are ahead of boys. It's uh, 10 in girls. It's 12 in boys on, you know, going into um, their um, puberty. Two years after puberty starts, that's usually when they start menstruating. And remember, that's about age 12. That's when the big growth part starts. So at that time, they're getting taller. They're getting heavier. They're irregular menstrual cycles, all because it's the beginning of puberty. We added in Fowler's faith construct in here just to let you know that young kids know what the parents teach them. And older kids will, again, um, make up their own decisions, what they want to believe or not. If they want to go to church or temple or whatever the name is, and always, like I said earlier, know who you are. That's all you have to know. You don't have to accept what they are. You just got to give them the time. So there are some basic calculations. I'm having at six o'clock a dosage calculation review. If you want to come, um, I'll be here. I wish you all the best. And I will be sending out these recordings as soon as I get them. Any questions?